Gotta sit here and eat. Hello, Professor. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. If I could get everybody to mute yourselves, that would be great. Now, if you have something to say, you can unmute yourself. Okay, let's get those cameras on if you have them. If you have a camera that's working, let's get it on. Thank you. Everybody doing okay? Yeah. I'm good. I'm doing well. How are it's you? Cold. Yeah, it's cold. Um, Sorry, I had a question. I don't know if you addressed this before. Go ahead. Uh, but the reading report is due before class, right? I don't, remember, I don't remember what time I said it was. It's basically due today. You can turn it in anytime today. Okay, because on your syllabus is 12 p.m., but on the turn it, it's 11.59 p.m., so at the end of the day? End of the day is fine. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, I think we're all set to go. Um, So let me do the lecture first. Uh, if any you guys have any questions while I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, talking, just you know, speak up, or you can chat. I'll be done by one o'clock, and then we'll go over the schedule a little bit. And then at one thirty, I'm going to meet with group number three, and then at um, two o'clock, I'll meet with group four. Those group meetings I'm recording and it might be a good idea for you all to look at them at some point before the, uh, the midterm. Because I do kind of go over stuff from the lectures and give little quizzes and stuff like that. And I'm recording this lecture so I'll put this up on Dropbox and also on YouTube, but I can't put them up on on Blackboard anymore because Blackboard I've already maxed the capacity just with a few lectures. So we're out of room on Blackboard for videos. Can you just post a link to, to the YouTube? Yeah, yeah, I'll send, you, I'll send you a link and it's also on Dropbox. You can okay, download good. it from Dropbox anytime. Because I had an issue trying to, um, well, I also have an issue on space because they're large files, um, but it wouldn't allow me to actually like fast forward so if I wanted to go back to a certain point of the video to listen to something again, um, it wouldn't let me. You're talking about on YouTube? On, I couldn't even see it on YouTube. I could only see it um, on Blackboard. And then I ended up downloading them and that was the only way to do it. Hmm. Was anybody able to look at it on YouTube okay? Yeah, it was fine for me. It was good. Yeah, for me too. All right, I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't understand that, but I will, I'll check the settings. I don't know, maybe something, but I don't know why that would be happening. Uh, who was it that had the problem? Me, Eduardo. Eduardo, okay. I also had it. I couldn't um, access it on YouTube either. It just stayed on Blackboard. Like I okay. couldn't get it to export. Huh. Okay, I'll check that out. It's weird.
Hmm. Let's see. So today we're going to talk about the um, New York City after the Revolutionary War, during the post-war period, and when the city had a the first of, of many population booms in its history. And then we're going to talk about how one building, one, one significant building encapsulated and symbolized the ambitions of an entire city. So just to pick up where we left off. So November 25th, 1783, was evacuation day. That's when the British finally, finally left the city. Washington rides into the city down Broadway and New York for the first time becomes an independent American city. And then six years later, New York becomes the first American capital but only for about a year. And uh, during that period when it was the capital, there was a significant plan of the city that was drawn by John McComb Jr. And it's called the city directory plan. And this was in the Manhattan and maps reading. So you should already know all about this. Um, and McComb was one of the first uh, well-known New York architects. At this point, uh, architecture wasn't really a profession in the way, in the modern sense, it was um, a little less formal than it is now. They didn't have licensing and things like that back then. And architects tended to be kind of, uh, they tended to be jacks of all trades. They would um, do surveying a lot of times and engineering and building. And so it was, architecture wasn't as specialized as it became later. So McComb was from New York City. His father had been a surveyor. McComb Jr. was also a surveyor and he was an architect and he was a map maker. And this was pretty typical uh, for that profession at this point. So he draws this map that you can see from the folds in it would fold up into a little city directory and it was tiny. The city directories at this point were about this big. And um, these were, so the city directories were issued once a year and they were the forerunner of later telephone books and Google Maps, you know. I don't even know if they make paper telephone books anymore. Um, so this map of the city I mean, what, so what's the difference between, between this map and some of the other ones we've looked at? Um, the main thing here is that you can see it's really beginning to expand. So you have this whole area, which was kind of spec speculative in the Montressor and Ratzer plan. And now you can see that it's actually turning into a reality and the city is gradually uh, moving this way up the Bowery into the farmland north of the city. And this whole area along the river has been laid out as well. Um, not so much over here because this is still a wetland. The collect pond is still there, you can see. So development was tending to go up the east side, not so much up Broadway, which is right here. This is Broadway at this point. But the city is beginning to expand. This is a, a later city directory. I just wanted you to see what they looked like. This is from 1835, 1836. Um, but they list everybody who was willing to be listed in alphabetical order. And they also included the professions. So their address, but also their profession. Obviously no phone numbers at this point. And they're, they're interesting because you can look at them and really get a, a sense of who lived where, uh, what kind of industries were in which parts of the city. It's really fascinating to, to do research with city directories. I've done quite a bit of that myself. And it included 
just about everybody. It was rich and poor, black and white. I mean, um, and so there are people like, here's a guy named uh, Richard Augustus, who's a shoemaker, all kinds of interesting um, professions. This one up here, I can't even figure out magic illuminations. Maybe, maybe he was a magician, I'm not sure. There are famous people in here. Here's the famous John Jacob Astor right here. And if they, here, this is his in-town residence, 35 Bessie. And then if they also had like a country house, they would put that too. So he had a country house in Hellgate, which is in like modern day Harlem. So after the war, um, the main task um, after 1783 was in rebuilding the city. Because you'll recall what was the big event in 1776 that uh, modified, shall we say, this, the urban landscape? What was the big thing that happened that required them to rebuild the city? The Great Fire. Yeah, the Great Fire. How much of the Great Fire, how much of the city was destroyed in the Great Fire? Does anybody remember? Yeah, quarter. 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 Yeah. About a quarter, yeah. Um, but that's a big area of the city to be destroyed. So um, throughout the war, when the British were occupying the city, they had to make do with tents and living in partially burned out buildings. So once it became an American city, the, the foremost task was to try to rebuild. And of course, this didn't happen overnight. It took years for them to rebuild the city, but gradually the population is coming back and the city is coming back. And they begin a program of public building construction. And one of the first buildings that they, they build of this nature was the so-called government house. And this was in 1790. Um, the style is federal and we're gonna talk extensively about that later in the semester. Um, so I'm not gonna dwell on that right now. But it's kind of like a neoclassical, American version of the neoclassical. A government house was built for the express purpose of housing the federal government because New York was the capital. They had every expectation that it would continue to be the capital. And so they need that, needed that kind of infrastructure to house uh, Congress and the president and everybody. So that was the original idea behind government house, but um, that didn't happen and I'll describe why in a second. So the site for government house is significant. So you're, you'll recall this map. All of you know what this is called, right? What is this map? The Costello plan. This is the Costello plan, yeah. So this is you know much earlier than what we're talking about now, but this is uh, the Dutch Costello plan and this is the fort here at this point, it's Fort Amsterdam, but then when the British, during the British period, it, it, it's called a series of different names like Fort George, Fort James, depending on who the British monarch was at the time. So it was Fort George when the Revolutionary War ends. And so uh, Congress makes the decision to tear down Fort George and build government house in its place. So. This is the little park that became Bowling Green. So government house was built right about here, facing Bowling Green with its back. The, the, from the back, you could have these majestic views of the harbor. And it was right at the foot of Broadway. And then uh, all of these addresses here, um, this, this area was getting built up by that time. Uh, Trinity Church was right here. The wall was gone. And this becomes like a pretty wealthy area of town. And so all of these buildings along here were, a lot of them were used to house Congress people. So John Jay lived right here, for instance. Uh, Hamilton had a uh, address on Broadway for a while. I think he, he lived right about here. So it becomes like a government center while in the brief period that New York is the American capital. But as I said, it took years to rebuild the city. And so there are still reminders of the war and the great fire. And this is Trinity Church, which burned in, in 1776. And it remained 
a ruin all the way up until 1790. So at this point, you can see um, that it's overgrown with, with vines and this became a, a reminder of what had happened and there were plans to rebuild it, but it took a long time to, to figure out. So in 1790, government house is built and also they finally, the uh, Episcopal church rebuilds Trinity church. So the same year. So this is the, the so-called second Trinity church, the second of three Trinity churches on the same site. And we'll talk a lot about the third Trinity church, which is still there today, a little bit later in the course. So it's a little bit more ambitious architecturally than the first one was. And it's Gothic revival, but it's kind of a, it's the Gothic revival in its infancy in America. The American architects and builders didn't really know how to do the, the Gothic revival as well as Europeans at this point. Later, they really learned how to do it. But at this point, 1790, this is kind of a, kind of a halfway version of the Gothic revival. But still, it was a, a, an important church for the city and important public building. So that's rebuilt on the same site, Broadway and Wall Street. And then Philadelphia. So this is a class about New York City, but we got to spend some time talking about Philadelphia. Um, Philadelphia then um, finagles the capital away from New York in 1790 with the so-called Compromise of 1790. It was a deal that was struck between Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. And so New York relinquishes its status as the capital to Philadelphia. So Philadelphia at this point is, is the main American metropolis. New York by comparison is still a backwater. And the plan was that Philadelphia would assume the role of the capital for 10 years while Washington DC was, Washington, DC was under construction. So the government house that New York had built for the purposes of the capital is never used for that purpose. And um, it ends up be, becoming uh, used for state offices and things like that. Um, so just a little basic geography here. Um, here's New York and here's Philadelphia. Interesting that all of these cities, you can, line up, you can draw a line through all of them. Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington. So Philadelphia is right here on the Delaware River, not very far away from New York. So the capital was in New York and then the capital goes to Philadelphia. So New York is no longer the capital. Philadelphia, so uh, Philadelphia had a lot of things that New York didn't have and that New York really, really wanted um, and now to top it all off, now they, they're the capital too. Um, Philadelphia had a grid plan. And this was, this had, had been laid out in 1682. This particular map was drawn in 1750. So this is what the city looked like right before the Revolutionary War. But you can see how precisely and logically it's laid out between the two rivers, the, the Delaware and the Schuylkill. Um, it has these nice straight um, streets and a, and a grid pattern. Um, it's got all these nice uh, docks along the Delaware River over here. That's where all the shipping came in. It has Broad Street right here forming a Y axis and then high street forming the X axis. Oops. And every single street here, except little dock street here, I don't know the story behind that. Somehow that survived from an earlier plan, I guess, but everything else is this rational, logical Cartesian grid. Not very many parks, although they do have Northwest Square here, Southwest Square here. And in the center is a waterworks. So here's a section through the water, the mechanism, and then here's the building itself. So it was a beautiful kind of neoclassical building right at the center of the city. So that meant, so Philadelphia had a water supply. So they had nice straight streets. They had 
a water supply, which meant that they had drinking water, that meant that they had water for washing the streets. So they would, they would spray down and clean the streets once a week. So Philadelphia was not only logically planned, but it was clean and healthy. And New York wasn't. New York was extremely disordered by comparison. And to go back to the Macomb plan for a second, you can see that these streets down here, a lot of them dating back to the Dutch era are not really laid out according to any sort of logic other than topography, right? So, um, and some of them had like this one Maiden Lane right here, it's curving. That had its origins in a, a little stream that the very first settlers found. And so that was originally a stream. Um, we've seen that Broad Street and some of these other streets had canals running up them. I think Broadway, uh, Broad Street was originally like a kind of a swampy inlet. So the logic here is just kind of organic and following the natural contours. You can see though that there is an attempt to make, to make it a little more logical. All of this land over here west of Broadway is a grid that was all laid out by Trinity Church. Um, and then you can see also that this is, this is uh, a grid here. This is land that was laid out on the former Delancey estate. And that is a pretty precise grid. It doesn't look like it because the map has been unfolded, but it's, those streets are pretty, pretty straight. And there's also a grid down here. So there were attempts to, to kind of rationalize New York City's um, city plan, but it wasn't cohesive in the way that Philadelphia was. And New York at this point had no water supply. That didn't come until much later, until the 1840s. So no fresh water and therefore no water to do anything, anything like street cleaning. So New York City was notoriously uh, dirty and full of disease. There was a quote that I read, so I think it was like 1800, 1801, around then, uh, in a Boston newspaper a reporter visiting the city and saying that in New York, there are dead cats everywhere. <laughs> and, and I don't think that was an exaggeration. There, was, there were um, wild pigs that would forage in the gutter on garbage. Uh, people would just throw their garbage out to the street. Uh, the, all the streets were, uh, weren't paved. They were dirt, so they would catch the rain and fill up with rain and snow, and and then that would make mud. And it was a notoriously dangerous, uh, dangerous and disordered and, and dirty city. So there was this characterization of the New Yorker compared to the person from Philadelphia that's encapsulated in this famous quote from the writer Francis Hopkinson. It's diverting enough to see a Philadelphian at New York. He walks the streets with, with as much painful caution as if his toes were covered with corn, corns or his feet lamed with the gout. While a New Yorker, as little approving the plain masonry of Philadelphia, shuffles along the pavement like a parrot on a mahogany table. And what he's saying there is that Philadelphia has nice paved streets, nice flat stone sidewalks. And so when they go to New York, they have to kind of pick their way across and they don't really know how to, you have to kind of have sea, leg, sea legs to navigate New York because the pavement is all uneven and uh, the roads are full of mud. And, and then conversely, he says, when a New Yorker goes to Philadelphia, they also don't know how to walk because they're so used to walking on, on uneven terrain that they look like a parrot trying to walk across a mahogany table, meaning like a smooth surface. So New Yorkers are kind of built to, to, to kind of hike through the city and pick their way. And people from Philadelphia are used to smooth surfaces. And so they are always stumbling when they come to New York. So this is just one of many characterizations of, of New Yorkers as being backward and people from Philadelphia as being cosmopolitan. So, but, so culturally, New York is really lagging behind Philadelphia and economically as well. But you can see here that in 1790, New York City is already bigger in terms of its population. Philadelphia at this point is really, really tiny. But then Philadelphia grows as, 
grows, but New York is growing faster. So 10 years later, um, the population of Philadelphia has almost doubled, but New York's has two. So by 1810, New York City almost has twice as many people as Philadelphia. So New York is becoming a real juggernaut economically and uh, commercially. And it's the reason for that is simple because New York had a really great harbor that was conducive to shipping and to commerce. And they were getting a lot, a lot of shipping, drawing a lot of the shipping away from Philadelphia. So both of them were commercial powerhouses, but New York City is starting to take the lion's share of imports and exports away from Philadelphia. And that's a trend that will continue through the next hundred years uh, until Philadelphia is completely vanquished as a commercial center. And New York is clearly the preeminent New York uh, American metropolis. So this begins right after the war and just gradually grows until New York is uh, much more uh, economically powerful than Philadelphia. But culturally speaking, Philadelphia is still the place to be despite what's going on with New York's growth. And um, Philadelphia had something that New York did not have. That's architecture. So New York had built government house, they had a city hall, they had built re Trinity, they had be rebuilt Trinity Church. But compared to what was going on in Philadelphia and had been going on in Philadelphia since before the war, New York could not compete with that, but they wanted to. Um, Philadelphia had really great architecture in addition to a really coherent city plan. So they had Library Hall, which was built in 1790, uh, the Bank of Pennsylvania, in 1801, um, the Bank of Pennsylvania was a Greek Revival building. We'll talk a lot about the Greek Revival in the second half of the course. And most famously, they had the Pennsylvania State House, which now we know as Independence Hall, which had been, had been built in 1753 and was the place where the Declaration of Independence was signed. Um, this was like the architectural jewel, really, of the whole country at this point. No other city had any building like this. And so New York is getting more and more powerful, but they're getting more and more jealous of what Philadelphia has. They have water, they have a beautiful, beautifully conceived and logically laid out city plan. They have beautiful buildings. So people are talking about Philadelphia as being the cultural capital of the country, not New York. New York is where people go to make money Culturally though, it's a backwater still. This is bothering New Yorkers. <laughs> they lost the capital to Philadelphia, it's bothering them. They need to be more like Philadelphia. So in 1803, um, they decide that they're gonna build a new city hall. And it's not gonna just be any other building. It's gonna be really ambitious. It's gonna symbolize everything that New York is trying to do commercially, culturally, and it's gonna be as good as anything in Philadelphia, hopefully better. Um, the Common Council debates how to pay for it and where it should be built and what it should look like and how they should select the design. The Common Council was um, the precursor of today's city council. And just like now they, referred to them as aldermen. So they put together a building committee and one of the people on the committee was uh, alderman, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his first name. His last name was Van Zant. And in the minutes of the common council meetings to discuss this, this is a quote that I pulled out where he says, we certainly ought to possess at least one public building which can vie with the many now being built in Philadelphia. So clearly they have Philadelphia in mind. So they have a design competition in 1802 and they begin construction the next year. Um, the design competition has typically been used as a way of selecting the architects to work on a building. 
they still happen a lot today. Um, we'll see later with Central Park, that was also a design competition. And the winners were, it was a collaboration between John McComb, who we know from the city directory plan, and a French American architect named Joseph Francois Mangin. And McComb was not as well trained as Mangin, who had been trained in Europe, uh, in France. So Mangin was also a New York surveyor like McComb, but he was just more highly trained than Macomb was at this point. So the, the thinking here is that Macomb got Manjan to help him with the competition because Manjan was a really great designer and was a better draftsman and everything than, than Macomb was, although Macomb wasn't bad either. So they're selected as the, as the winners of the competition and um, construction begins. So, 1803, they start building, it's not finished until 1812. And in fact, in 1815, they were still doing some carpentry on some of the rooms inside. And it, so it wasn't completely done until 1815, but it was ready for occupancy in 1812. Uh, why did a, one building take so long? Well, there were a lot of factors in this. One, it was the most ambitious building that New York had ever undertaken. So it was really expensive. And New York didn't have a lot of money at this point. The government didn't have a lot of money to spend on this. Um, and it was, this was <clears throat> early, you know, first decade of the 19th century, no water supply yet, no sewer system. So there was a lot of disease. So every single year, just about the city would be visited by yellow fever. And this was a yearly epidemic that would happen. And, uh, the city would basically close down in the summer and the early fall until the first freeze came in. This was something that they, they didn't know what it was. They were, there were all these ideas. Um, we'll talk more about epidemics when we talk about the water system a little later, but um, they didn't know why people were getting sick and what caused yellow fever. It turns out it was the mosquito. It's a virus that mosquitoes carry, but they didn't know that. So it would show up in the summer when the mosquitoes were at their worst. And then in the fall, when the first freeze would come in, they, it would kill the mosquitoes and then the disease would miraculously go away and then it would come back the next summer. So the city would just basically close down during the summer and fall. So they didn't do a lot of construction. There was an especially bad epidemic in 1805 that killed thousands of people in New York. Um, so a lot of years they didn't make a lot of progress and then they couldn't work in the winters. Uh, the 19th century was, the snowfall in the 19th century was epic. I mean, if you think this is a lot of snow we're having now, they would routinely have like two feet of snow, three feet of snow. So it made it hard to do construction in the winter. So a lot of times they would have to shut down operations in the winter as well. Um, Macomb and Manjan wanted to use marble. There aren't really any marble quarries close to New York. Well, there, 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 were, there was one up in the Bronx, but they wanted a special type of marble from Massachusetts. So they had to ship it down from Massachusetts, uh, which took a long time, they had to come down the Hudson River and it was really expensive. So it was difficult getting the, the right building materials and there were the usual management problems also with between the architect and the city, the common council and um, who was gonna be in control of the project. So Macomb ends up being the project manager. So he's the person who's overseeing construction and going to the site every day and also going up to Massachusetts to inspect the marble and, and everything. And Manjan disappears, at least from the project. He's not, he did the competition, but then he doesn't have anything to do with City Hall. And in fact, when they laid the cornerstone of the building, he wasn't even invited to the ceremony. So he kind of disappears from the project and Macomb got most of the credit for it. 
So the building site is really interesting and important. Um, so you'll remember this is the Montressor plan from 1766. And you can see that the old city hall was on Wall Street about a block east of Broadway. Um, and then they decide that they're gonna build a new city hall up at the old commons. And this was the uh, city owned, originally a pasture for the Dutch livestock. At this point, it's not a park yet in the modern sense of the word. It's just kind of a open public space. And you can see it's got some municipal buildings on it, um, including a prison. I think this is a prison or maybe this one. So there's a kind of a collection of buildings on the commons. And so, but they chose it because you can see here in the, in the, in the Montressor plan, the commons was still kind of on the outskirts of the city on the northern edges. But by 18, uh, 1789, when Macomb draws this plan, it's more like really in the center of town. So that's why they put it there. They, they, they knew that the city was expanding and they wanted the new city hall to be in the center of the action, right? So they put it in the commons because it was right in the center of town. Um, this is a much later uh, diagram from 1910 of city of the commons, which became city hall park. But this shows the, the footprint of uh, city hall. So you can see how it's, it's right in the middle. This is the front. So the idea was that you could look south from the city from the front porch. Uh, and also that if you're coming up Broadway, you would, you would see it like a stage set in front of you. Uh, so they didn't, they didn't want to put it in a line of other buildings or, or in a crowded city block. They wanted it to be on, in its own space, set back from the street with enough area around it that you, you would notice it. So, uh, they were trying to make sure that people visiting the city would see this and see how much work and money they had put into it and be impressed by it and go home and say, wow, New York is really coming up. They're, they're building some really great buildings. And the, the choice of the site was also important in the, in the civic memory of New York because this it resonated with people because only what 30 years earlier, it had been the place where Washington had had the Declaration of Independence read to his troops. Uh, it was where there was a series of demonstrations in the lead up to the Revolutionary War. So, it, and a lot of other things that happened there, demonstrations, rallies, executions, all kinds of things. So as a site, it was really loaded with a lot of historical um, memory. So that's another reason they put it there. It was significant. It was a place that was significant in the minds of New Yorkers. And of course, the commons then gradually becomes City Hall Park. And it's still there today, and City Hall is still there today. Um, so it wasn't just a building, right? City Hall was necessary because they needed more room for government offices. So the common council had a, a room here. Um, the mayor had a office, his offices there. The governor had a room there. And it was meant to house all, the, house all these municipal uh, offices in, in one building. So it was necessary, it was bigger than the old city hall, but it was also a symbol and it was really important that um, that New York has a symbolic centerpiece to the city. And it was as ambitious or more ambitious than anything that had been built in Philadelphia or Boston or Baltimore or Charleston, which were the, the main competing cities at this point with New York. And it, you know, at the time also it was pretty it was large, you know, for, for its time, 
12, it's finished. It was, it was pretty much the biggest building in town and people would talk about how large it was and it maybe it was too big and too expensive and a, a waste of money. And of course, if you go there now, it's surrounded by skyscrapers and it looks like a tiny little jewel in the middle of the park. But it's still there today. And um, the original material on the front was marble, but it gradually deteriorated over the years as marble will. It's very susceptible to acid rain and things like that. So they replaced it with limestone, I think in the 1950s. So what you're seeing now is, is limestone. Originally the rear facade on Chamber Street was brownstone. And brownstone was a much cheaper material than marble. So they put, mar they put marble on the sides and front and brownstone on the back just to save money. And then they, they built this beautiful uh, cupola on the roof here with a clock tower. And for years that also had the, the city's one fire alarm bell in it. And if there were a fire went off, they would ring the city hall bell, which is ironic because in 1850, 1858, uh, during a celebration, uh, some fireworks caught on the, the roof and burned the entire cupola off and the whole uh, first, the whole top level of, of City Hall was destroyed and rebuilt. So City Hall is still there, but you know, it's gradually changed over time. Not the original facade, not the original roof, not the original cupola. So that's often how it goes with, with architecture that lasts, it gradually changes and is always kind of in flux. Um, Oh, so the, the, so in terms of the architecture itself, it's kind of an odd duck because the exterior and the interior are different styles. So you look at the exterior and you go, okay, it's French, it's French Renaissance revival. And then you go inside and it's something completely different, which is federal. And we're gonna talk more about the federal when we talk about housing, but the, the exterior is, is, is French Renaissance, which means that it's kind of fussy with a lot of ornament, a lot of detail, and it's kind of delicate looking. And then inside it's much more kind of straightforward. There's ornamentation, but kind of restrained ornamentation, which was what, what the federal style was all about. And so there's a theory, which is probably true that, that Manjan designed the outside and Macomb designed the inside. So this is straight in the front door. So you go up this front steps into that door right there. And this is what you see right off the bat. So you, there's this um, staircase going up to the second level. And then if you walk up the stairs and look up, you see the in, interior of the, uh, sorry, of the dome with a stained glass window at the top. It's really pretty spectacular. And so that part, which burned in 1858, is not original, but it was rebuilt. Um, but these stairs here and these doorways and everything are all original. So you, you go up to this level. This level is kind of like sacred ground in American history because that's where Lincoln's body was laid out after his assassination. So he lay in state right at that spot there. You can see him there. And everybody was allowed to come in and pay last respects. And so um, it lasted for hours, as you can imagine. Thousands of people were lined up to go in the front door of City Hall, up one side of the staircase, past Lincoln's body, and then back outside again. Um, so that's another kind of civic memory that is still, I don't know, I, once you know that that happened there, when I go there, I kind of feel it. If I didn't know that Lincoln was there at one point, I probably wouldn't notice it. But uh, since I know that he was, his body was lying there at that point, it's pretty heavy to go, to go in there and, and stand on that spot. So Professor. Yeah. Do we know if the original dome offered 
also had a, a covered ceiling? Yeah, as far as I know, they just, they, it's, it's, I think it may have been even rebuilt twice. I, I'm, I don't remember, but, or at least built and rebuilt and then restored more recently. But yeah, they, they copied the original design. Okay. So, so that's what Macomb's dome would have looked like. And we know that because we have Macomb's original, Macomb and Manjan's original drawings. So they were able to work from the original drawings, which I'll show you in a second. Um, good question. So this is the governor's room, which is on the top level. And so this is kind of typical of one of the rooms inside City Hall. Uh, this has been rebuilt and restored as well. Um, so that would have been the original paint color, which is a very special uh, shade of green. I can't remember what it's called. And this room, like a lot of City Hall had been kind of destroyed over the years and um, misused and, and vandalized and disrespected. And then more recently, they went in and did a really meticulous restoration. And they were able to pick through layers of paint and get back to the original paint and analyze it and then make a new batch. And so this is now the original color it was. Um, and there are tons of paintings on the walls. And um, that's a painting of Macomb himself which is right uh, over the doorway here. That's Macomb. Looks like a nice guy. And this is uh, a partial elevation. These were their original, Manjan and Macomb's original competition drawings and they still exist. They're at the New York Historical Society. Um, this is an elevation. Uh, this is from a book, but they have the original at the Historical Society. This is an incredibly beautiful section cut through the building. Um, here's the front steps. Here's the uh, entrance. Here's the, you go up the stair here. And then here's the, the dome and the skylight and then the cupola is over here. Um, I haven't been up there I would like to go up there, but they wouldn't let me go up there last time I went. Um, and then I think this is the governor's room that I just showed you. And there are a lot of other rooms in there, like uh, the mayor, mayor's office is still there and um, city council assembly room and all that stuff. So the drawings are at the historical society and you can make an appointment once the pandemic is over, you can make an appointment and go see them. And they're very nice there and they will show them to you and you can look at them. This is my studio from last spring, right before the pandemic in February, we got to go and look through the drawings and uh, they have everything there. They have elevations, sections, plans, details, notes, tons of stuff. Okay, that's gonna do it for today. Um, does anybody have any questions about the lecture? And then I'll, I'll go over the schedule a little bit too. Um, could you possibly remind us, sorry about that noise. Could you possibly remind us of the um, style that was used on the outdoor and indoor and, and who likely contributed to that? I, I just didn't catch that. Part. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and you guys, if I ever go too fast, just tell me to slow down. So it's French Renaissance revival on the outside. And that was probably designed by Manjan, the French architect. And then on the interior, it's Federal, which was probably designed by Macomb. But we don't know that for sure. They also may have collaborated equally on it, but it's, it's curious that they're, the style changes once you go inside. So I kind of believe that Macomb probably designed most of the interior. And then you can see this in the governor's room, this is total federal style, very restrained, classical. Um, even for a building of this stature, it's pretty restrained. Symmetrical, um, but not as exuberant as the later Greek revival, which we'll look at, or the Gothic revival. 
I have a question, Professor. Yeah. I'm kind of confused. Um, so who commissioned the City Hall building? Was it the city government or was it like the citizens of New York? No, no. Like all paid their money to. It was the city government, totally. It was the common council. You know, with the backing, with the backing of business people, you know, clearly, but the money was raised by the city. And um, it was a city project. And it was kind of the first big scale, expensive infrastructure project that the city had undertaken. What immigrants were coming in, like in the early 1800s around that time? Oh, that's a really, that's a good question too. Um, well, immigration has always been something that is defined New York. So there were always immigrants coming in. At this point, like first decade of the 19th century, it's a lot of uh, people from England coming over and you're beginning to get Irish immigrants for the first time, like significant numbers of Irish immigrants, but it wasn't not anywhere near the levels that it would be later, like 30, 40 years later when uh, there was a wave of Irish immigration that coincided with the great hunger, the Irish famine. Um, I think the probably the biggest group at this point was English. And then Italians, not so much. That wasn't until more like the la later half of the 19th century. Um, so yeah, it's mostly English at this point. But I mean, you know, certainly people from Portugal and Italy and Sweden and uh, and there was still slavery, so they were still bringing slaves over from Africa. If you could call that immigration, I, I, don't, I don't think I would when it's not their choice, but uh, there were still a lot of enslaved people coming over from the Congo and Angola and places like that. Uh, I, I don't know if that's true what I heard or not, but I think even Irish, the first people who came were came as a slave or they became uh, slave, slavers here. As far as I know, I'm not sure that. They weren't literally slaves, but a lot of them were indentured servants, which is basically not the same thing, but kind of close to it because they didn't have a lot of rights and they had to, they couldn't leave and things like that. So you mentioned that uh, Philly became the capital after uh, New York was there. Was that because like they, like the, the, um, the government, people in government thought that New York was dirty or they just thought that Philly was a better city for it? Oh, uh, no, it, that decision had nothing to do with the state of, of New York City or Philadelphia. Um, I don't remember, it's called the Compromise of 1790 and I should know that, but I'm just looking it up now. I figured the reasons why or maybe a little outside the scope of what we're doing, but if you're curious, I'm just looking it up. Um, yeah, it was a compromise between Hamilton and Jefferson. It says Hamilton won the decision for the national government to take over and pay the state debts. Oh, right. And Jefferson and James Madison were both Southerners. So they what they got was out of the deal was not that Philadelphia would become the capital, but that Washington DC would be built in the South. And Philadelphia oh. was just the the kind of uh, temporary solution. Okay. In, in exchange for paying off New York's debts. <laughs> so, you know, a backroom deal. The, the story I heard about that is that it, Jefferson and Hamilton walked up and down Broadway until they worked out the details of the, of the agreement. Yeah. But that might be an urban myth, I don't know. Oh, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I don't know if I'm getting ahead of like ourselves, but um, what's the difference between the French Renaissance and the French Renaissance revival? The difference between the French Renaissance and the French Renaissance revival? Yeah. So um, the revival styles, architecture styles are, um, it just means that there was a renewed interest in a style that had happened years before. 
So this happens with virtually every style. So the French Renaissance architecture was literally the architecture of the French Renaissance. And then much, much later, three, 400, year, 400 years later, there's a revival of interest. And you see this happen over and over again. So there's the Gothic architecture of the Middle Ages, 1100s, 1200s, all those great cathedrals like Chartres and things like that. And then 19th century interest in that, which becomes the Gothic revival. So Gothic architecture, Gothic revival. There was also um, Greek architecture of ancient Greece, Parthenon, et cetera. And then the Greek revival of the late 18th, early 19th century, where there's a rediscovery of Greek architecture and a fascination with it. So a, rev a revival just means like a you know, renewed interest. And in the form itself, I mean, they're pretty similar. It's just that one is the original and one is the copy. Does that answer your question? Yes, I, I just thought there was like a, like a difference in that. Yeah, that answers the question. Thank you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think uh, it's what sparked it is um, specifically the image of the map and how drawing a straight line interconnects uh, New York City, Philly, and DC. Um, and that's very uh, kind of mas Masonic in style. Um, what kind of a contribution are we looking at uh, where the Masons actually started playing a role in the development of New York? Since um, I'm assuming uh, where I've read somewhere where Washington was a well-known Mason. Um, just want to get your take on that. I know absolutely nothing about that. I wish I did. Um, I don't know. That sounds like you're a Mason and you don't want to say anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a Mason, I swear to God. <laughs> um, I know nothing about the Masons. Sorry, but now I'm curious, so. Maybe I'll read about it and know more next week. I mean, they are a secret society, so it makes sense. Yeah, and I, I have heard that people like, I don't know if Washington was a Mason, but a lot of the people of that, you know, prominent merchants and, and politicians were Masons, yeah. Um, and there were other secret societies, like there was the Society of the Cincinnati, which Hamilton was a member of. But beyond that, I don't really know. Uh, did, I, did I mention the connection between Macomb and Hamilton? Because I meant to. No. I forgot. So let me mention that. So Macomb and Hamilton were friends. And Macomb had designed a series of lighthouses all over the country when Hamilton was the secretary of tre the treasury because somehow building lighthouses fell under that department. So Hamilton hired Macomb to design these lighthouses and then they got to be friends. And then ha uh, Hamilton hired Macomb to design his house in New York up in Harlem, which is the Hamilton Grange, which is still there right around the corner from City College. And that was built in 1802, so right before Macomb wins the competition for City Hall. So that was one of his, that was kind of on his resume. So he was well known as a friend of Hamilton and a accomplished architect at that point. Um, I don't know if Hamilton had anything to do with getting Macomb the commission for City Hall, although it's very possible that he influenced the committee in some way. Uh, and then of course, Hamilton famously is killed in a duel when City Hall is under construction, so in 1804. Fun fact, Professor. Alexander Hamilton was born in Nevis, where I am right now. Oh, you're in Nevis right now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's great. Are you from there? Yes, my mom. I, I grew up in St. Kitts. Oh, great. Yeah, Hamilton is from, from Nevis. 
And it's pronounced Nevis. Yes. Not Nevis. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so are there any, any sites in Nevis related to Hamilton? Um, uh, there's the Hamilton estate, which I don't think he really has any influence mm -hmm. other than, you know, him being from Nevis and they just naming the place after him. Cause I, if I remember correctly, he would have left Nevis at a relatively young age. Yeah, I think um, he was like a teenager maybe. Right. So I don't know how much, if any of an influence he would have had on, you know, stuff that was happening on the island mm -hmm. prior to moving. Mm -hmm. But I think because he rose to fame, then there would have been a couple of structures named after him. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really interesting. It must be really beautiful there. It is. And the weather is uh, very nice. Oh, it's nice and sunny today. Very mm. windy. Mm. <laughs> Rub it in. Rub it in, Xavier. <laughs> <clears throat> well, we might all just show up on your doorstep. All are welcome. You'd have to take a COVID test, though. No problem. Okay, um, let's just go over the schedule real quick and then I'll let you guys go. Oops.